Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, we are happy and honored to have you today with us in the worldwide streaming video of the Geneva Debates 2020. Organized by our Geneva-based Briot Foundation for Architecture in the framework of the research and cultural program, the EcoCentury Project. For those that don't know us yet, we are a philanthropic organization focused on architecture, planning and the landscape in the prism of the environmental urgency. The Braggart archives kept in our foundation's basement in Geneva are open to all those who wish to know more on the evolution of modern architecture, notably in its Geneva version. Since a few years now, our foundation has undertaken, undertaken a strategic role in the understanding of our Anthropocene era and in contributing to the outline of a bold, efficient and community-based project for the ecological transition. So with the outburst of the epidemics, we were particularly attentive to the belying and unplanned ground experiment that started changing Earth as the Associated Press qualified it. As people across the globe stayed home to stop the spread of the coronavirus, the Earth has cleaned up, although temporarily. Smoke stopped choking New Delhi, one of the most polluted cities in the world, and India is getting views of sites not visible in decades. Nitrogen dioxide pollution in the northeastern United States is down by 30%. Rome air pollution levels from the mid-March to mid-April were down by 50% from a year ago. Stars seem more visible at night. People are also noticing animals in places and times they don't usually, like coyotes who have meandered along downtown Chicago's Michigan Avenue and near San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. A puma roamed the streets of San Diego in Chile. Goats took over a town in Wales and deer roamed down the roads in eastern France. In India, already daring wildlife has become bolder with hungry monkeys entering homes and opening refrigerators to look for food. All this looks somehow like daydreaming, unless the monkey steals your favorite cereals. We have the impression that our decades-old dream of a cleaner planet became reality at the cost, as we all know, of an unforeseen world economy recession, as well as a world social crisis. And the question is, what's next? Do we want, do we need to go back to business as usual? Can we pause for a moment and take advantage of this incredible parenthesis in order to reorient our agendas, policies, and modes of life? Can we, and our decision makers, above all, develop the necessary pathways towards a zero carbon urban environment and what would this urban environment look like if we decided to implement a serious, profound and irrevocable change to our systems and modes of life? Where should we start from? What steps should we take? How many of us are there to make change happen? Because we've noticed that when humanity gets sick, nature gets fine. And we understand that if ever nature gets sick, then humanity will get even worse. So welcome today in this extraordinary format of a video debate that might become the new norm in our post-pandemic future, our distinguished guests. They will address from their point of view the extraordinary challenges that define our strive to keep humanity on a positive curve while protecting the biosphere and becoming resilient in the face of future sanitary and environmental crisis. We invited Claudia Binda biochemist and dean of the ENAC at the EPFL, Stefano Boeri, architect and president of Triennale Milano, Maria Neira, director of public health, environment and social determinants of health at the World Health Organization, Thomas Velakot, CEO of Worldwide Fund in Switzerland, and Matisse Wackernagel, founder and president of Global Footprint Network. Following these densely prepared presentations, we shall have Peter Droge, Director of the Liechtenstein Institute for Strategic Development, President of Eurosolar, a European Association for Renewable Energy, and past grantee of our EcoCentury project, as well as Robert Sadler, economist, former UN humanitarian worker, and member of the scientific board of the Breyer Foundation. They will question our guests and assume by assessing the current crisis issue and the prospects for stable climate through action in the built environment and they would suggest as well possible pathways to action. If possible, we shall take questions from the public and we shall end with a toast to our Earth. 
So our first speaker is Matis Wackernagel. It's great to see you all here in these strange circumstances. I'm here in um, California. It's still morning. That's why the light is still not that strong. Um, and um, glad to be with you together. So we were asked to kind of put a 10 minute introduction each, which I will uh, do here, essentially the intersection between COVID and overshoot. Uh, what's happening? So let me look at the context first um, and say, this basically, this slide shows the transition we are in. Uh, in the past, humanity was a small part. Our economy was in a small part of the overall Earth. Uh, so it's called an empty world. And now we're in a situation that's now called the Anthropocene, where the human presence has become overwhelming uh, for the planet. Now, there will be a way to get back out of overshoot, whether we like it or not. The big question is, and you're in that profession, whether it's by design or disaster, um, or because somehow the, the forces balance things. Uh, and now we are also facing the other challenge at the same time, which also is a reflection of overuse to a large extent, um, that something is coming back, so the, the coronavirus. Uh, and people say it's like that we have now two different time periods before Corona and after Corona. What can we learn? I think there are two key insights that we can draw from this experience. The first one is something that we knew before, but just thought it was kind of a theoretical thing that we are one biology. Everybody is connected with everybody else. The virus has no, uh, uh, doesn't, have, doesn't have preferences. It spreads to everybody. Our fates are intertwined. We are one biology. And, and that has implications because we start to recognize that our fates are intertwined. And even for countries like Switzerland that may have thought they're totally protected from anything else. So the sustainability issue is just a tragedy for all the others that we have to nicely help. Um, is now recognized, wow, it can hit everybody. So we're all in it together overall. Obviously, it hits us unevenly, but that's one thing. The second insight from the COVID situation is probably even more profound. What we all learned is that the most heroic thing that we can do is to protect ourselves in order to protect others. We are staying at home because that's good for us, but it's also good for society at large. And I think that's an interesting insight that will come also for the sustainability discussion. Because too often the rhetoric is about, oh, we should be nice to the others, but what's in it for me? We haven't recognized that adjusting our own cities, our own countries, our own businesses for the future that we can predict, which is one of resource constraints and climate change, is good for us but it's also the most heroic thing we can do for the world. If Geneva can operate with the foreseeable kind of no fossil fuel economy with much less resource throughput, that makes Geneva workable and it also helps the world to be able to operate overall. Uh, say, so how do we know, how can we act up upon it? Obviously in order to act we need to also understand where we are at. We are on a spaceship called Spaceship Earth that doesn't have a fuel gauge. And what we are adding is to say with the fuel gauge, we can be a little bit safer. The way we look at the world is to say overall, what's limiting us is how much Earth can regenerate. So we map everything against how much of the Earth regeneration is needed to support Geneva, Switzerland, the world as a whole. And what we conclude is that currently our demand, humanity's demand, that's based on UN statistics, represents about what 1.75 Earth would be able to renew. Or to say it differently, from January 1st to about end of July, humanity is using as much as Earth can renew in the entire year. 
So obviously that is not workable. And then we also need to recognize that maybe humanity is just one species. We don't want to use the entire planet. How much of the planet should we use? Maybe not one. So using 1.75 currently while only having, while maybe using less than one planet shows that there's a, a big discrepancy uh, that uh, we are not paying that much attention um, to our fuel gauge. Uh, what's, what's, the, what's the response? We call it move to date and we deliberately call it move to date. We don't call it reduce your demand because if you say reduce your demand, people just feel that we are taking their chocolate away and they shrivel and they say, oh my God, it's gonna be a terrible word. By saying move to date, we have two messages. One is we're in it together. We have to move to date collectively. If I just move my date is not gonna help at all. We have collectively to move the date of Earth Overshoot Day um, further into the future. And by doing that, by, by having more time, like eventually going beyond even December 31st, um, we'll be in a safer world. So we're building more resource security. We're not taking away chocolate. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's the point. So it's psychological, it says it's in it, we're in it together. And it's not about taking away, it's about building a stronger future. How do we do that? Essentially, it goes back to COVID, and that's my last point. Uh, the, the, the main idea is to say, given there's overshoot, given that we only have one planet, what does success mean for you? How do we need to operate that you will be able to operate well into the future? And there, the built environment is essential because what we build today will be around for a long time well before 2050, if we want to cope with the Paris Agreement or if we want to live up to the Paris Agreement, we have to be out of using fossil fuels well before 2050. Your buildings will far outlast 2050. So your buildings will be operating, your infrastructure will be operating in a totally different world that we can predict. So if we continue to design things that depend on resources that are not available, we endanger ourselves in two ways. One is that the value of these assets will shrivel away because it just will not be useful. And what's even worse, that the value will be shriveling away at a time when the economy is frail. It's a bit like pulling the mattress away as we fall on the floor. So design is really key. We will come to a different world, whether by design or disaster. Your profession, our profession is focused on design. How do we design something that works? And recognizing it's a positive sum game. It's not just giving up yourself for the benefit of humanity. It's about how do you organize your own success, recognizing that your success will also make it much more likely that the others can be successful. So that's kind of the insight, the intersection between overshoot and uh, COVID with these two lessons. We are all in it together, but we are one biology. So it, there's a self-interest story. And the second thing is the most heroic thing you can do is to protect yourself, to prepare your own way, because that also protects everybody else. And that's where design comes in. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Matisse, and sorry for my interruption. It was a, a network problem here at home, so sorry for that. Excellent. So, a new world anyway, by design or by disaster. Uh, that's uh, the thing to, that one could uh, stay with. And we could move along with uh, Thomas Velakot now to see how the natural uh, question, the question of nature, the parameter of nature could be integrated or not, or could uh, participate in this design uh, issue that we might want to follow. Uh, Thomas. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, hosting this debate today. And I do apologize for not sharing slides. I'm afraid you'll just have to make do with a talking head here. Um, so let me just start really briefly to... Um, summarize what the ecological crisis is from our point of view that we are facing. And clearly this is a, a one hour presentation condensed into two minutes. So, so apologies for the, um, for the brevity for not going into more detail. 
But what we are facing at the moment, as Matisse uh, has already um, shared with us, is an ecological crisis of a unique um, size and, and urgency. It's a dual uh, ecological crisis in the sense that on the one hand, there's the climate crisis. Uh, if, we look at, um, if we look at greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the situation we're at today is really quite unique. Uh, it's not been at the level we are today uh, for the past 800,000 years. Uh, so a very unique and a very dangerous situation we're in there. But similarly, uh, we face a second ecological crisis, which is the biodiversity crisis, in that to take just one um, measure, if you look at populations of vertebrates, they have declined on average by 60% in the past 50 years. So we are way, way above levels of extinction that we have seen historically. So really to summarize the situation ecologically, we are altering the biological and the physical pro uh, properties of our planet like we have never done before. And the driver, and Matis has already talked about this, the driver is of course the massive overconsumption of natural resources. We're basically pretending that we have two or three planets when in fact we only have one, which is a very dangerous situation to be in. Now, the positive in that is that we've also never had a higher level of awareness and concern uh, among populations than we have today. So that's kind of the background against which now we have entering the COVID crisis. And in the context of COVID, uh, we've seen sort of two narratives develop um, which I'm not sure if they're very helpful as we think about the future after COVID, uh, as it pertains to the ecological crisis. The first narrative is this, um, and Panos has already uh, cited it, is this kind of nature is coming back. You know, the, the swans and the fish are in Venice and the deer and the boars and the kangaroos and the elephants show up in the streets and all that. I'm not sure if that is actually going to help us uh, on this road. Um, because frankly, if CO2 emissions are down, if, um, if aerial pollution is down now at the moment, it's down for a, an obvious reason and it's down for a non-sustainable reason. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's how change happens. If we look back to the financial crisis of 2008, what we saw is after the crisis, we actually had the largest jump in CO2 emissions worldwide that we've ever seen. So there was this sort of, you know, yes, you had a, uh, you had a downward thing and then you had a huge big catching up happening. So I wouldn't rely on these wonderful pictures um, to really help us on the way uh, to solving those ecological crises. The second narrative um, we've been hearing now in COVID about the ecological crisis is, okay, it's back to business as usual. All we have to do is bring the economy back. You know, we don't have any time anymore for this fanciful um, action on climate change or protecting species. That was so 2019, you know, now it's back to business. I'm not so sure about that narrative either. Um, actually, when I've talked to people about it who've been arguing this, they've been able to come up with very little evidence that that's actually what's happening. Um, and, and I think there's this inherently wrong understanding that people can only care about one thing. So either you care about your health or you care about the climate. That's not how people work. You know, I can wear a bicycle helmet when I go cycling and still buy insurance for my property against, against, um, against burglary or against a fire. You know, we can care about more than one thing at one time. And if I look at the numbers, you know, our members, if I look at people who volunteer with us, if I look at people who subscribe to our material, all of those numbers are up compared to a year ago. So I have no indication whatsoever that people all of a sudden don't care about these environmental issues anymore. So, okay, if it's not about the swans going back to Venice, 
And if it's not about, it's only going to be about business in the future, what is the effect of COVID uh, on, the, on the ecological crisis and the way we face it? Well, it's interesting, if you look historically at pandemics, um, they tend to have, they tend to do uh, one thing. They tend to emphasize weaknesses that were already there beforehand, and they tend to amplify changes and trends which were already underway before. And I think that's what's really happening now. And I'd like to share with you three trends like that, which were already happening before COVID, but which I think are much more relevant now and will actually be very relevant for us as we face these, um, these ecological crises going forward. The first trend I'll call welcome to the hybrid world. And what I mean by that is just simply a much larger percentage of our interactions are taking place digitally today than they were two or three months ago. Uh, I mean, the obvious case is us here, right? You know, in a, a year ago, we would have had a panel and we would all be sitting in a room somewhere. Now we're doing it digitally. Now, this doesn't mean that the physical will all of a sudden disappear. But I think what will happen is that we will go back to, do, to doing some things physically while doing others in a digital format. I think we will think much more carefully about which meetings is it actually worth traveling for two hours to? And which meetings can I, can I do by phone or by video as we are now? So the mix will shift. And that's nothing new. That's what happened when online banking came along, for example. It didn't mean the end of having physical banks, but it means I go to my physical bank much less than I used to. And I go there because I want an interaction which, I, which is much harder to do uh, in an electronic format. And these things were already happening. This shift to more digital interaction was already happening. I think what's changing now is that it's just going on steroids because you're basically putting a third of the world population on a crash course in digital interactions. So your usual sort of adoption curve, you know, with the, with the alpha users and the early adopters going first and then gradually others coming along, it's just being compressed really radically through this crisis. And I think that's going to change things. Um, I think that's going to lead to companies reassembling their, their, their uh, supply chains. I think it's going, going to lead to all of us interacting in a different mix. And all of that is hugely relevant for that use of natural resources, which we refer to that overconsumption. And it's hugely relevant also to the way we create um, space and the way we design space. So I think that's one trend we should really look to going forward and how we can use it. The second trend I'll call Big Brother Just Got Bigger. And what I mean by that is not the sort of the state surveillance, but more generally, the role of the state is shifting very radically in this crisis. We are already seeing that, that the state, and this happens often in crisis, the state plays a bigger role. And after a crisis, that doesn't just go back to the status we have before. So for example, if you take the rescue packages that were agreed in the US, they are already more than twice the amount of the rescue packages after the financial crisis. So it's massively, massively increasing the role of the state. Now this is neither per se good or bad for nature. It can be either, it can be, or it can be both. It can be good if we use this uh, more assertive role of the state, for example, in fighting climate change or the loss of biodiversity, in that the state plays a more important role because we need states to play an important role in these transitions. But a stronger state can also be bad for nature if a stronger state starts propping up failing fossil industries, for example. And that is already happening. In the US, for example, you, got, you get the government saying that they want to rescue oil companies. In Germany, you get the government talking about a, a cash for clunkers program where they want to pay people to buy the last generation of internal combustion engine cars before, they sw before we switch to electric vehicles. 
And here in Switzerland, of course, we've just we've just rescued for the second time my national airline, um, you know, and, and a, a, a sector that has already been very heavily subsidized in the past. So we have to look as citizens, we have to look really carefully, what is that more assertive role of the state going to be going forward? And the third trend I'd like to uh, briefly mention, which I think is relevant uh, in how we face uh, the ecological crisis after COVID, is the idea of one planet, one health. That's a concept that the World Health Organization has been using for some time, so it's not new. And uh, it's something we are also observing in, in interactions with, with a growing number of people that where in the past, a lot of people felt that protecting the environment was something nice to do, but it wasn't really something essential. It was about protecting the polar bear because they're so cuddly and wonderful. And I think what more and more people are realizing now is that if we protect the environment, we're actually doing a lot for ourselves, for our health as human beings, and for the health and survival of our children. And that changes everything because all of a sudden it's no longer just about the polar bears, but it's about me and my children. And whatever your political orientation is, as mammals, we are programmed to look after our young. So if we are threatened, if we feel our children are being threatened by something, that takes on a completely different importance. And I think what this crisis is showing us is just how closely human health and planetary health are actually linked. Um, you've got the whole issue of zoonotic diseases becoming much more likely if ecosystems are destroyed. If you get, for example, expanding agriculture and intensive agriculture where, um, on, on converted land, where you get wild animals, domesticated animals and humans being much more close to each other in closer proximity, that makes for breeding grounds for zoonotic diseases uh, that can jump the species barrier much more easily. A second area where the, you see this linkage between um, the planetary health and human health is an illegal wildlife trade where the sale of wild species in wet markets and their consumption have been identified as direct causes for several zoonotic diseases from HIV to SARS and Ebola and probably COVID-19 as well. And a final way in which you see that linkage between human health and planetary health is that people exposed to air pollution actually suffer much more from COVID than, than people living in places where the air is clearer. So we have that close link between human health and planetary health. We have a new role that governments play, which is much more assertive. And we have a shift in the way we use digital, um, digital interactions. So what does that mean at the end of the day? What can we do? Well, I think, first of all, it's really important we understand this crisis and the nexus between the COVID crisis and the ecological crisis. And it's important we look at evidence rather than speculation. And there is a lot of speculation out there. I think the second thing we need to do is we need to reflect on the changes we're observing and we need to share those observations. And that's why I welcome panels and discussions such as this today, because this is how we reflect. And finally, we need to act. We need to act to amplify those trends which we are seeing accelerating through the crisis. So I think we can amplify the shift to digital channels. We can act as citizens to stop our states from propping up failing fossil industries. And I think we can build on the understanding that planetary and human health are closely linked. So that when we fight against the destruction of nature, we do so for nature's sake, but we also do it for our own sake. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Thomas. Very clear and very uh, concrete. And um, we'll keep that for our future discussion. I'd like to invite uh, Claudia Binder that will, uh, will have to leave us relatively quickly. She can hear us. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. So let me, um, I did prepare a few slides though, and I would like to, to share them with you try to really see, um, uh, put maybe a slightly different take on that. 
and looking into tipping points and lighthouse behaviors and then trying to figure out where does really uh, the COVID crisis have an effect and, and uh, not. So, so let me start with this very um, easy figure or graph. So um, here I put the energy system. Let's see if we go uh, to the energy system. Let's see our current energy system, for example. If we continue the way that uh, we have been working so far, let's I call it old habits, we will end up with a non-sustainable energy system. It's, it's clear for all of us. So this means this why, for example, with the SDGs and our new targets, we are uh, putting a lot of effort in research and development to achieve a sustainable uh, energy system through our innovation. So what I claim is that these old habits uh, or this innovation will only trigger the old habits to change if we surpass a tipping point. And then this will mean then we achieve a transition. Now the question for me is, does COVID-19 really support us in having this tipping point? Does it maybe reduce the hurdle of this tipping point? So this is kind of as an entry uh, statement into the whole discussion. So does it accelerate the transition? Does it shift the transition to one place or another? Does it really change even the, the final uh, point? claiming, for example, that we will now, now we should not care about energy or about climate change because now we have to carry, uh, care about the economy. Changing completely to a new, uh, another aspect, let's look into pro-environmental behaviors. And I was asked also to compare a little bit the, the effect of uh, potential universities in, uh, in um, changing pro-environmental behaviors. And what you can see here in this uh, figure is actually the degree of pro-environmental behaviors for mobility, home life, waste, recycling, food, and purchases for different type of actors within the EPFL. So here's the bachelor students. They have uh, uh, 3.45 out of five uh, points for pro-environmental behavior and so on. The good news what we can observe is that from bachelor to master's, we get an increase in pro-environmental behavior. That means we are significantly getting better, which also suggests an effect of the university in this respect. And actually, if you look at the more green type of um, faculties that we have, for example, the ENAC faculty being environmental engineering, civil engineering, architecture, the effect is even more, uh, even higher. Then we see that that effect actually flattens out and one very surprising thing that, that we found was that technical personnel, administrative personnel, behaves more environmentally sound than the others do. If we go now and, uh, and ask ourselves the question, so what drives actually these pro-environmental behaviors? Here I put together a slide uh, focusing on the key areas that we found. And you can see three elements that are important. One is green self-identity. So if people claim that they feel green, that they are green, they are likely to behave more pro-environmentally sound. Second, if they're willing to sacrifice, their pro-environmental behavior is also higher and women tend to be uh, also more environmentally sustainable in their behavior. So again, here the question would be, does COVID ha has an effect on my green self-identity? Would it actually have an effect on my willingness to sacrifice? Well, we are sacrificing somehow, I don't know. Does it change something in these driving factors for environmental, um, pro-environmental behaviors? Or is there even a new factor emerging that will trigger pro-environmental behaviors? If we try to understand actually what are the behaviors that we are looking into, we found actually that the behaviors, the categories that I showed you in the beginning are not equal. So doing an, an analysis, we found that there are several types of behaviors. The one are the lighthouse behaviors, the ones that are told that they are to be relevant in media sources where we can show off that you are really green. The other one is the effort-based environmental behaviors. So you save money, you save resources, but they cost you some effort. Then a third category, kind of reuse, repair, share, then transport, and then washing cold and eating vegetarian, kind of a, a small group. What is interesting is that these categories are actually not related only to food, 
or not relating only to washing, not relating only to heating, but are related to what people see what I do and how much effort I have to put into it. Now, if we cross these two elements that I mentioned before together, we can see that, for example, these lighthouse behaviors, they are driven by the, the need to feel good, to show that I have my, my green, um, uh, uh, I'm willing to be green, I am also willing to sacrifice. So, so this, what shows off, what other people can see from myself is something that is important for, um, uh, for these uh, lighthouse uh, behaviors. And the question would be, do these lighthouse behaviors now stay with COVID? Do they become even more prominent with COVID? So if I, am I proud to telling my, my colleagues that I have not been uh, uh, to a cruise here this year? Or will I be even more proud that I went despite of COVID? We don't know how this will show off. So here it's about positive lighthouse behaviors, but also lighthouse behaviors can be found in the non-environmental relevant um, behaviors. Then what I find very interesting is that social pressure and perceived behavioral control, that means how much I think I own, I can steer what I'm doing, are important for this effort-based pro-environmental behaviors. And again, for this transport, behaviors, we can see that also the, the identity feeling good and the expected positive impact as well as the willingness to sacrifice play an important role. So let me summarize very, very shortly because I was asked to talk very short about this. So if we look at these determinants for pro-environmental behavior, the one thing is my green self-identity, the willingness to sacrifice and female versus male, female, and the rest social norm doesn't play a very important role. So the question is to which extent um, have these determinants changed with COVID-19? Will they change with COVID-19? Will there be a new determinant with COVID-19? How does it manifest then in the, uh, regarding also in the university context? And then second, feeling good and having a willingness to sacrifice are highly correlated with Lauta's behaviors. Are new lighthouse behaviors emerging with COVID-19? Might they be really not even related to a willingness to sacrifice? Might they be related to the normal way that they act uh, today? So we are doing an interview actually, and one of my colleagues just told me today with co people who, who um, about the confinement, and uh, out of 40 interviews, it mostly emerged people are actually, they, they like it. They don't think that it's as bad as they thought. So they were really thinking that it's less stressful, that it might be having advantages to work in the way that we are working now. So are we, are we trying really getting into a new era that might even trigger and reduce this tipping point that I went, was mentioned before in order to obtain a more or to achieve a, a more pro-environmental way of behaving in the future? So thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, maybe one of the determinants that might be also discussed later and one that probably should somehow be added is the feeling of emergency. How do, we, do you act in relation to urgency, which for the moment seems to be coming up as a new factor, adding up to the other factors that you have been uh, proposing um, uh, yeah, actually, maybe uh, one short word on this, Panos, uh, because th this links up to some research that we have been doing on, on sustainable and healthy eating. And what we have been finding there is actually that people want to eat healthy and then they can eat healthy. So they have this sense of urgency, which is also with the COVID-19 actually the case. And it's actually only the case because the, the, the federal ministry is telling us that we are not allowed to get out. If it were not the case, people would just uh, would probably not keep to the rules, so if it were not the federal ministry, uh, the federal government. And uh, But then if they want to eat environmentally sound, they state that they would like to eat environmentally sound, but they don't achieve in doing so. So there is a, there is a clear difference bet between what is health related and what is related to environmental issues. Yes. And, uh, and people, already, all of them, and they also in these interviews, it came out that people think like, it's great, we look at the sky, it's beautiful, the environment is recovering, but none of the people interviewed actually believes that this will hold on. Right. 
Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Claudia. We are still expecting uh, Maria Neira to enter, but in the meantime, we might uh, ask uh, Stefano Boeri to talk to us about this uh, possibility to, comp to compile the feeling of urgency of environmental protection and change and the long uh, term in which buildings and cities are being conceived and constructed. Probably there is some sort of uh, hiatus there that might be discussed today. Are you there? Stefano. Uh, yes, I'm talking from Milano. Milano is one of the epicenters of the pandemic. And uh, just let me start with uh, just a tribute to Germano Celant, who died just yesterday. He was a giant and hero in the culture and, and art field. And uh, he was a victim of this, uh, of this pandemic. Uh, and together with Germano, we started to, to imagine how at the end of February, beginning of March, how to deal with this, uh, uh, let's say, unexpected uh, tragedy. And the first, I think the first, uh, let's say, consideration is about uh, how we have, let's say, uh, in a certain way, completely destroyed the idea that events, single events, could change the history of our species. Uh, if we go back to the annal, uh, to the Brodel uh, concept of history and that idea of long durée, uh, or what was coming from the French geographic uh, concepts in the in the 20th century was was the idea that uh, well the, the history is not run by events but it's run by uh, processes that have a very long time lasting for long periods. Well. I think that this event is contradicting drastically that approach. What we see is a single event that has changed the life of humanity, uh, totally unexpected, uh, totally unpredictable in a way. And I, I think it's, uh, well, we cannot forget that. Uh, but for sure it's, it's true what was predictable, but from a certain point of view, there were people thinkers, writers, novelists, artists have started to, to think about that. This Michael Crichton, 1980, Congo uh, novel, uh, but uh, just to not bet, I think that also the David Kriman spillover book has more or less the same cover, was written uh, basically eight years ago. And uh, it's about uh, how, let's say, the way we are used to deal with nature was creating the conditions for the zoonosis processes and for the pandemia. And uh, I think that's something that we cannot forget. We cannot forget how with forestation, how it was uh, sprawled, we have invaded the habitat of other um, species and how now they are back. They are back in our empty cities and that's a sign that uh, an ancient deal with other species has been broken. We'll do something now there to restore it. Uh, I think we, we have to work uh, in, in order to uh, be very precise in demonstrating and describing how this pandemia is uh, strictly connected with, uh, with the climate crisis. Uh, and from that point of view, I think that we have not forget uh, what we have learned in the last, uh, in the last year about the necessity to have a, it's a kind of uh, holistic approach to climate crisis. So we have to do a lot of things. We have to do all that together and we have to do all that now immediately. Uh, but at the same time, we cannot, uh, let's say, forget that uh, uh, we had a long, uh, uh, let's say, three of uh, uh, attempts to uh, improve the quality of life of our cities. I think that the first uh, challenge that this let's ask us is how we can make our way to uh, explore and to inhabit the public space and the public realm still alive. So I'm, I think we have to work a lot in order to refuse this concept of social distance and that we can accept the concept of body or physical distance but refuse the concept of social distance. And in order to do that, what I suggest is to do, go back to a very, very famous seminar on it by Roland Barthes in uh, 1977 in Paris, College de France, where he was talking about 
uh, comment vivre ensemble, to live together. I feel that that issue, that topic, the subject is extremely important now. We have to study how we can refuse the, the dystopia of a digital sphere. We control everything in our lives. We are geolocalized and controlled in relation with our connection with the, with the disease. And the other side, we have to refuse that other dystopia of a public space has to be, let's say, uh, redesigned by barriers, by fences, by walls. So, uh, uh, comment vivre ensemble, uh, there is, a, is a, I think, is a, is a very, very important uh, uh, concept and it's a very important question and we have to do our best to answer to that time. On the different level, uh, at the same time, we cannot forget what we have done in order to, uh, let's say, rebalance our relation with nature. You know that Tenero Milano, I'm running Tenero as a president, and we have just closed a few months ago an exhibition that we have prepared together with Mama New York and Paolo Antonelli, and its title was Broken Nature. And the exhibition was hosting artists, uh, pro designer, researchers, and the subject was how we could repair, how we can, let's say, restore what we've done for nature. Uh, how we can, uh, let's say, improve uh, our relation with the nature that we have destroyed, that we have transfigured, that we have contaminated. Well, only, only, honestly, in in few months, uh, the world has changed, and uh, I'm, I think we should probably, if we could go back, we should probably totally change the approach to the relation with nature. Is the nature who has contaminated us in a way? Nature is part of us. We have understood that. Let's, Michel Foucault was saying, nature is coming inside us, some, something which is completely unpredictable and uncontrolled. And that's uh, a new uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, human nature relation that I think we have to, to explore. Uh, just to conclude, I think we have to, to not forget what we have tried to do in the last years in order to tackle climate change and uh, making this pandemic simply uh, just probably a real reason to do that. Uh, so uh, we have worked a lot on, on the relation with, uh, with forest and woodlands uh, and how to change city. Cities are uh, only the 3% of the surface of the merger land. Uh, we know how well that at the same time, this 3% uh, is uh, producing 25% uh, of the CO2 present in the atmosphere and absorbing basically the major amount of, of the natural resources. And on the other side, uh, uh, if we think to forests and woodlands, uh, uh, we cover the 30% of the surface, the major land, but uh, what they do is uh, absolutely uh, necessary, important, crucial to the future of humanity, uh, simply because they protect the balance of biodiversity of the species well, they produce and they absorb the 30% of CO2 and so on. So I think that uh, one of the main issues here to develop is the idea of ecological planetary corridors. We were discussing this with FAO, Kew Garden, uh, C40 City in New York and last uh, Climate Change Forum in September. And the idea is to try to see if it's possible to imagine a series of this uh, world part that are connected, protected area, uh, woodland, forest and green cities, cities who ca should become greener in the next future. So I, I just said, you know, that the reference is probably this amazing uh, project, which is already ongoing. They started in 2007. Uh, it's, a it's a continuous uh, uh, 15 kilometers large and 8,000 kilometer long uh, uh, forest that are uh, together uh, on one side, Nigeria and uh, Eritrea on the on the eastern side of Africa in order to stop the extension of the Sahara Desert. I think that that's a model of something that we have, we should have to do, and we have the model that has to be rethinking in order to make our our city greener. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Stefano. Clear and uh, well illustrated. But while uh, waiting for uh, Dr. Neira to come in. I would uh, first of all ask uh, Peter and uh, and Robert have some reactions on those on those uh, uh, presentations. Now um, we we I'm saying we because 
all the presenters uh, focus on the we, on the us, without really disclosing who that is. Um, on the one hand, it's us as we sit around this uh, Zoom session, but uh, we're not really talking about the 85% of people who are not in the privileged position of uh, benefiting from our uh, lifestyle. Just think of the uh, semi-incarcerated uh, migrant workers in Singapore or in the uh, Persian Gulf. Or think of the poor people of uh, Manaus and, and the Brazilian rainforest, the main city uh, under the Bolsonaro regime, uh, are dying by the droves, essentially abandoned. So there's a different side to that us um, that needs to be recognized when we dare speaking about us. Um, we also have to recognize, and it's something that uh, Thomas has spoken about, but also was addressed in Matisse's talk a little bit, is this notion of uh, governance and the idea of uh, political action and strength um, that comes from the realization that um, the virus is presenting a challenge, a collective challenge. Um, now, this is a, a unique moment in our history where we are the ones uh, incarcerated in our individual rooms and spaces, while um, the agents of political power continuing their practice. So it's, a, it's kind of a reverse prism, not prism, but prison we are in. We are locked away while the Trumpians and others are um, dismantling environmental legislation and while uh, fossil fuel industries continue their rampage, uh, while the financial sector is uh, getting away with, uh, with murder, in fact, reaping most of the COVID benefits. What I'm trying to say here is that, uh, as a question to the speakers so far, perhaps also a question to those that still come, how do we seize, how does one seize this moment uh, not not as a post-COVID opportunity, but a, a, an opportunity during COVID, where this huge amount of money is being expended without much accountability, where the unprecedented capital expenditures flowing into areas which are really reinforcing the status quo rather than seizing this a moment of the great switch. I really like Thomas Wackernagel's notion of coasting a little longer at a low uh, level of a lifestyle expenditure. Um, now, that needs to be combined with at least a couple of other measures. One is the redistribution of wealth so that those that are at the starving end of the COVID crisis do not actually starve. And secondly, uh, that we do uh, find a way of uh, engaging in governance uh, while our civil rights are being actually stripped away for health reasons. So there's a contradiction there, and I'd like to challenge perhaps, uh, especially Thomas and Matis, but perhaps also Diane to um, respond to that uh, sort of larger environmental political challenge of seizing the moment, recognizing that we are in a very special moment in history and a very special moment in, in which we need to rem uh, remember that we are out of time. We are in, in the overshoot. We are not facing overshoot. We are overshooting. So uh, leave it at that. I've got a couple more observations later on, but this uh, I hope will um, continue the wonderful presentations we already have. Great, so uh, Matisse, you may perhaps have a word to say. To me, yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for these, all these great presentations. And um, thank you, Thomas Velikart and Efren Burry and Christine Binder. Um, I think one of the key elements, psychological elements, I would call in English skin in the game. And I don't know if you know the notion of skin in the game, but it's coming out of the investment talk. Like I think uh, Warren Buffett was one of the ones who promoted this kind of idea. He says, I want to have skin in the game in my investments, meaning that if the investment goes sour, it goes sour for me as well. And I think what COVID showed is that we all have skin in the game and we start to act very, very quickly. So it's building a lot of political will. And it even came before. For me, like the, the, the most amazing thing about our young Swedish friend, Greta Thunberg, is that maybe the older generation sees her as a moral voice, 
but truly she represents skin in the game because what she says is to say, why are you killing me? Why are you cutting my life short? She doesn't say, oh, let's be nice to the Ethiopians. You know? I mean, also, of course, but she's, she feels that she is in that game. It's about her. Oh. Her success depends on resolving this problem. And I think COVID has also brought that before. So the teacher's question, where is the, the moment to kind of to seize the moment? I think the more we can tell the story and engage others from an identity perspective as well as Christy um, um, mentioned, to say, what's our skin in the game? Why does our action, why does my success depend on our action? I think that's where the shift happens. Too often we are in this mind space of just being in the noble cause. We talk about the noble act of sustainability because noble sounds so noble, so we're in love with noble. But noble is the most destructive path <laughs> because we only do it on Sunday afternoon. So how do we talk about this transformation that is needed the same way we hold toothbrushing? You know, toothbrushing is not a noble cause. I mean, it's a bit noble, but most of all, it's necessary for me. And it's not just necessary for me in this moment. It allows to maintain my <laughs> teeth health in the longer run. So how can we tell the story? And I think COVID gives us that hook to start to recognize we are in the game. It's our game. I think that's kind of my seizing the moment perspective. Let's recognize that we have skin in the game and let's talk about that we have skin in the game. And how do you recognize somebody who says they have skin in the game? Those people who say we should do this, we should do that. They indicate that they're not in the game. They indicate that we will never do it. So as we change our language and say, what do you want? I want, like for example, I want to live in a city without cars. That becomes identity, that becomes you. That shows that you're in the game. When you ask, are you optimistic or pessimistic? You indicate you're not in the game. Because if you ask a soccer player, are you optimistic? They say, I'm playing. And I think that's kind of, that means skin in the game. So I think the more we can invoke the sense of skin in the game and link people to say, actually your success depends on us resolving that, us humanity. That's how we move. And that's, I think, my answer to Peter's great question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh, thanks so much for this response because it puts together the us and the I in a very interesting, direct way. If uh, Thomas has the, we, we see Maria Neria coming in the virtual room, but before that, maybe uh, Thomas has a, a, a different answer to Peter's question before having Maria talk. Thanks. Thanks, Panos. Um, just three quick um, things I'd like to pick up from Peter's comments there. One, Peter, you talked about the poor. And I think that's incredibly important that we don't just talk about us in the sense of us sitting here in Switzerland. Um, I talked about One Planet, One Health and how planetary health and human health is incredibly strongly connected. Well, for the poorest, that's even more the case. The poorer you are, the more directly you depend on functioning ecosystems, for example. If you get your water not from a tap, but from a river, your survival depends on the quality of that water. So I think that is actually even more true for the poor. Um, second point, you talked about fossil fuel companies rampaging and banks. Um, important point. Um, the fossil fuel companies are struggling for their very survival at this point because, of course, the crazy effects this crisis has had on the oil price. We've had negative oil prices, something we've never had before. This is the most dangerous point in time because oil companies are experts at regulatory capture. So they're experts at getting cash out of governments. And because they are struggling so strongly, the risk of regula regulatory capture has never been this strong before. And we really, really need to look out for that, that our governments don't give away our tax dollars and francs and pounds to fossil fuel companies. What was interesting on the finance, on the bank side, was um, Two weeks ago, something happened that not a lot of people paid attention to for obvious reasons, which is 
Barclays Bank, the British bank, announced that they were adopting a net zero CO2 uh, policy. Uh, so they were going to net zero carbon emissions, not just their own, but what they were actually investing in. Now that is particularly relevant because Barclay is the largest uh, financier of fossil fuels in Europe. And the fact that they did that in spite of COVID shows me that you know climate is not something that has just disappeared off CEO's um, agenda. It's something that's very much still there. And the final point I want to pick up, Peter, of what you said is the role of governments. And we absolutely have to hold governments to account. That has never been more important than now because they have had um, such strong powers, emergency powers. We need to make sure that we as citizens have control over what's happening. The interesting thing is, of course, tyrants have loved this situation, right? Because they've had an excuse to accumulate all this power. We've seen that with Orban in, um, in Hungary, for example. But the interesting thing is tyrants have not been performing very well in this crisis. Look at Trump and what a fool he makes of himself every, every night as he gets up um, behind the podium. Look at Bolsonaro, who, who is getting concerts of people banging pots every night because they, they just realize how completely out of this world he is with his policy of denying that COVID is happening. So I'm actually, I'm actually positively surprised at just how much the so-called strong men are struggling in this situation where they should really, you might expect them to really shine in a, in a crisis like this. Well, they are not shining. They are just, people are realizing how, what a pathetic uh, pose they're, they're, they're giving. Fantastic response. Yeah, citizens being alert, probably this is one of the things we should keep on the, from this discussion, also the importance of uh, the scientific knowledge in, against uh, tyrants attitude, which is, I think, one of the other elements that we should keep. Now, uh, Maria Neira, welcome to our group. Uh, hope you're doing fine. Well, so we had a, 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 some, so, some talk until now, but you're coming from the front. I understand the World Health Organization is for us all today somehow, somehow the front of, on this battle. I'm sure you're having lots of things to say and to share. But the main question for us today is how this health crisis could pertain to a global understanding of the, of the ecological crisis, what could be the connections and what could we do with it? Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you and sorry for, for being connected later. We were discussing on the COP26 and how the COP26 has to incorporate the health uh, driving force and making sure that this will be the, the bigger argument. I said people doing this. So before getting into my remarks, uh, I can't resist to do some marketing approach here because uh, you were talking about who has been showing a good performance as a government uh, or a leader of a government. And um, I have to say that if you look at the woman who has been running countries, um, sorry, gentlemen, but I'm afraid they have been proved to be the best. So <laughs> just as a marketing thing for the woman. Uh, and <laughs> well, I hope it will be like that until then. Okay, let me now be, go back to, to the horrible crisis where we are uh, in the middle of. I mean, this is a kind of shock. Uh, I, and as you know I, know, I don't need to describe you that this is just uh, not just a, a, a health crisis. This is a a terrible socio-economic crisis. We, we, we already have uh, predictions on how this will bring more poverty, hunger, social unrest, uh, recession, and uh, I mean, we, we don't want to be very pessimistic, but this is really dramatic. And this has never ever in the history of public health happened before. Not because we didn't have a big public health crisis, but never uh, during a uh, public health crisis, we never ever even dream about the possibility of asking countries to paralyze all economic activity, to just uh, confine, ask the population to go home and stay there in the name, allow me to, to use that expression, in the name of a virus. 
So I'm saying this because we need to analyze what has provoked this capacity of the governments to tell citizens, stay at home, this is serious, paralyze the economy when something like that never happened in the past. And you all know that on the climate change front, on our air pollution front, we have been trying to uh, discuss with the car industry, the energy sector and saying, oh, you need to reduce your benefits maybe eventually. And uh, in the name of the economic argument, they always say, no way, there is no way to stop the economic development. And now suddenly because of a virus, everything has been paralyzed and we have time to rethink, to do a big rethinking. Now, it will be absolutely responsible to go out of this crisis the same way we, we went in. I think it will be totally morally and, um, and irresponsible from a political point of view and from a citizen point of view. So we need to take this opportunity to now reconnect and say, okay, what will make us less vulnerable in the future? And I think this is the language because now um, the citizens, the last thing they want to hear after the, the, the coronavirus crisis will be, here is another crisis. Here is climate change. This will be horrible. This will be killing all of us. So we need to be prepared to use a narrative that will be very engaging, inspiring, common sense, and talking the language that the people is ready to, to, to absorb now. On the other hand, we will have the governments, all governments, all types of governments, trying to push for an economic recovery because it makes sense. Of course, they, they all need to, to move quickly on this economic recovery. So how can we influence that economic recovery in saying, okay, there is a good possibility for have a, an economic, healthy and green recovery and, and, and moral one and uh, with equity because this, the, the, the crisis is telling us that we need to reinforce our health systems and having universal health coverage because you know when you go to the United States, you have 30 million people without uh, uh, health protection for, for their citizens. We need to be better prepared in terms of preparedness and response for, for pandemics or infectious diseases. But we went as well to reduce pollution because pollution and, and, and an environmental destruction is one of the reasons why we are where we are now. So we need to prepare our population to say, okay, what will make your health less vulnerable? What will protect you more? And what will protect more the citizens will be cities where uh, they are not surrounded by cars permanently, where the air pollution or the air quality is, is definitely uh, uh, much better, the air quality. We want people when they take off their masks, now that you have the population wearing masks, which is something that makes me crazy, by the way, but uh, the day we will take the masks off, we want to breathe clean air. We don't want to go back to the, the and keep the masks because the, the, the quality of the air we are breathing is, is very bad. So we need to provide all of those economic, social and healthy arguments to make sure that we move the agenda rightly. On the climate change negotiations, again, I think that the, 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 um, the citizens will be very intolerant to a very heavy bureaucratic and process oriented, uh, again, COP. And this time it has to be health as a, as a main uh, goal for, the, for the, the climate change mitigation. And then other benefits will come from that approach, economic, social, environmental. And I think that will be the, the driving force at the moment. The other thing is that our cities, our urban development needs to be definitely completely changed. And this is where we can have a lot of, of, of impact. Uh, any urban planner, is, is a Ministry of Health, a good one, uh, because all the decisions you can take at the, at the urban uh, environment will have a very positive or negative impact on people's health, depending how do you use that power. We need to offer a good solution in terms of uh, transport and mobility, 
a, a solution that will not end up with people uh, taking the private car because they don't want to be on the bus where everybody's wearing masks and they, you have an overcrowding and they don't want to, to, to take uh, what they are considering now as a risk. There is an opportunity as well for people being closer to the, the nature because they realize that uh, the urban and the cities are not uh, providing them during this confinement the, the type of life they, 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 they need. And um, I think it's not a dream to, to go on a different way. My last argument is about um, the economic incentives. There will be now a lot of um, stimulus packages by the banks, by, by, by different governments. We need to make sure that they are done rightly. And those stimulus packages are going into the right direction and not going for the same mistakes again, for example. Now the governments are, pay are paying 500 billions into subsidies for fossil fuels, 500 billions. However, if you take the externalities of the use of those fossil fuels, means how the use of fossil fuels is affecting the health of the people by causing air pollution essentially, and then killing 7 million people every year, because air pollution is killing 7 million people every year, 7 million premature deaths every year caused by air pollution, household and, 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 and ambient air pollution. Fossil fuels alone will be something like 3.5 million deaths, only the use of fossil fuels. So if you look at that, those 500 billion subsidies into fossil fuels, if you take the real figure, it will be five trillions, five trillion dollars, because in fact, you need to include into those externalities how do you pay for your chronic diseases caused by uh, breathing this uh, polluted air, how your health system is already uh, under pressure because all of those chronic diseases will re require a long-term treatment. So this language of, of uh, wrong investments are affecting your health right investments will protect and make you less vulnerable. And those are the interventions we can offer as people concerned about good urban planning, healthy urban planning, better mobility, and, and, and changing the, the, the sources of energy we are using and going back for an environmentally friendly and low carbon economy. I think we need to keep health very high on the, on the agenda because those are the arguments that now will be mobilizing people and being very sensitive about not giving, again, advice to people on what you have to do, but what I will do, and I will stop buying uh, cars that are polluting, and uh, as health professionals, we want uh, a different uh, source of, uh, of um, energy, and we want to reduce air pollution because we saw that this will be affecting even more the COVID patients, because obviously your lungs will be much more vulnerable, and um, therefore, I'm very much in favor of this healthy, green, and, and common sense recovery, if I may. Over. Thanks so much for this uh, input and these thoughtful positions that will probably trigger lots of discussion, although I think most of the people would agree with the health priority as part of the environmental agenda. Uh, I'd uh, directly uh, turn to, my, my, to um, Robert Sadler, who's been uh, listening and taking notes, I'm sure, since the beginning, to question and uh, pose some remarks. Robert, are you around? Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Um, yes, I had some questions arising from the discussions, and thank you. Though this has been a very, very useful discussion. I think one of the first questions I had was for Stefano. Um, you mentioned, talked about the question of public space. Would you say perhaps that COVID, if we used to talk about the tragedy of the commons, where for those who are not familiar with the term, the term essentially means that if you choose to use a public space for grazing sheep and everyone does that, then that public space becomes devalued and ruined because no one else can use it for grazing sheep. And would you perhaps say that this COVID-19 has created the tragedy of the public space and that the public space might become devalued? Well, I think it's a very serious concern. It's a very serious concern. Um, 
but uh, I still think that uh, we have to do our best to, let's say, imagine how a public space could work. Also, if although if we we take care of uh, of uh, what we are used to call social distance, or let's say I prefer to call uh, physical distance. Uh, I, I believe that, that the public space, the, the, the main, the main uh, character of public space is that it is basically unpredictable in its possible uses. It is uh, its generosity. So is a public space, a space where everything could happen. And uh, I don't think that uh, the, let's say, uh, necessity to uh, imagine uh, a major distance in the different bodies is in itself is in itself uh, uh, the uh, exclusion of any possibility of uh, conserving this nature of uh, unpredictability in the public realm. So I, I I think we have to work on that. It's a uh, something very very serious and let's say not easy, but we have to work on that. I, I'm just saying what I'm doing with the Triennale, Triennale of Milano. What we are planning to do is now, uh, well, to, to, let's say, extrovert, export, move all what we have done, what we are used to do in our building, uh, theater, concert, exhibition, but also dialogues uh, in the open space, in Milan, everywhere, in the squares, in the streets. So if we are planning to have, a, like, say, Theater company that I will work in the streets. We are planning to have concerts in the squares. We are planning to have uh, uh, dialogues in the gardens. Yes, that I know. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's a hope, hopefully it's a temporary condition, but I think it's important that we react, not accepting the two dystopias of the total, let's say, digital uh, control on one side and on the other side the other dystopia of. Uh, of the public space that I was seeing is destroyed by the necessity of uh, protection that COVID is calling us. Just a really quick thing I'd like to add there. Um, I spend a lot of time in, 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 not just in COVID times, but generally in the forests around Zurich. They have never been as crowded as they are now. They have <laughs> never been that many people recognizing the value of nature as there are right now. That is also the public space. And, and so, you know, maybe some public spaces are currently devalued and I hope that won't last, but others, pub, other, other public spaces, particularly nature, has never been more highly valued. I totally agree. I think you're totally right, yes. Uh, if I may, I would also suggest that there should uh, be a diff distant differentiation between the public space and the space of the public. Space of the public is the place where people go, like the forests, but the public space is the space of debate that we know from our European, especially uh, tradition, the place where things are exchanged and where actually where political and uh, citizen uh, alert, citizens uh, negotiation presence is possible. Therefore, uh, although the change now is, is, is I mean, the, the space of the public becomes bigger and broader because there are spaces where we can go and others that we shouldn't go, like the squares in the middle of Milan or of uh, Madrid. The question would always be, where should people meet and demonstrate their positions, especially today, as Thomas himself and, uh, and uh, Matthias said about the, the need to be, to be alert in front of positions and decisions of the of the governments facing uh, that will probably affect us all um, but the other i would be ready to open the the floor to the public if there are any questions but in that case someone should be able to unless there is another round of uh, questions between uh, robert peter and our guests uh, peter yeah i just wanted to i mean i don't want to Maybe you can collect through the chat or uh, the yeah. question, a collection, whether there are questions and then choose those questions. Uh, yes, please send us some questions if you want us to send the questions and then we can pick you um, as, long, as soon as I'm 
done with, well, I have two questions, but here's one that is uh, perhaps most salient to what's just been said, but uh, both by Maria and by Thomas. Uh, Thomas has very briefly alluded to uh, a phenomenon which, um, and then quickly moved on, um, understandably, because it's very uncomfortable, but um, a phenomenon that alerts us to the question whether we're actually able or to plan together. Um, this COVID thing sort of shows us we're actually not really very well able to plan. We're able to react to a perhaps a collective response to the history of bacterial and viral pandemics that we uh, as a humanity uh, experienced over the last few thousand years. I mean, all these pandemic experiences that led to the collapse of the Roman Empire, onto the Black Plague, to the um, plagues of the 16th, 17th and 18th century and so on. So there's a collective response against the virus. It's a bit, you know, um, understandable health oriented. But when it comes to this um, uh, spike in CO2 that um, Thomas referred to, um, we tend to normalize it by referring to Paris or to COP. I mean, as a provocation, I would like to argue that it's a great opportunity that this year we don't have a COP. Because the COP has been hijacked uh, equally or even more by the fossil fuel lobby uh, as it is being occupied by those that hope for change. Um, something much more dramatic has to happen. It's not just that we have to target 1.5 degree and no more. This is far too high. We need to target zero degrees above pre-industrial levels because we have already an excess of CO2 in the atmosphere. We're way above normal. What Thomas referred to is the fact that we were at a level of CO2 concentrations that we had or the earth had when it had six degrees more temperature. And if you look at methane levels, they are 250 degrees above that level. We're also losing oxygen each year at a much lesser rate. We're losing 100 gigatons of oxygen uh, that don't come back. 40% are due to fossil fuel burning. Fossil fuels consume 40% of the 100 gigatons of oxygen are being lost in the atmosphere each year. Um, so this is a, a moment where we need to recognize we're way beyond what we can possibly manage with the existing policies, with COP, with the lifestyle changes, with the reduction of um, the footprints, uh, all these comfortable, but timeless measures which have not really led to any change. So this, the question to you all is, all the presenters, but all the audiences, what moment, momentary or momentous transformation of our collective practice can we imagine where we combine this, this, this awareness with action, not just in energy transformation, now with COVID investment and the outlawing of any COVID investment in fossil fuels, but the mandating it to switch to renewables, but the simultaneous regeneration of the uh, biospheric systems to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, to reduce this excess concentration that already exists, down from 420, hopefully there'll be an overshoot of no more than 450, 480, 500, back down to 280 where it should be maybe in 50, 100, 150 years from now. Now methane is up at close to 1900 parts per billion. And that, that can be achieved more quickly because methane is a more fugitive, more quickly um, deteriorating molecule. But CO2 will stick around. And if we don't actively absorb it into our forests, into our wetlands, into our agriculture, uh, which is another major emitter of CO2, we will not make it. This COVID, the Black Plague, all these plagues combined are a walk in the park compared to what climate change has in store for us. And here I'd like to just end on this question of time and the suddenness which we will experience this transformation. Well, the suddenness is in the atmosphere, in the air right now. We, we have the Arctic melting, destabilizing the polar jet stream, the the polar vortex, uh, destabilizing the jet stream, creating a kind of a chaotic pattern in the so-called Rossby waves, the, the gravitational waves that transform or communicate pressure 
between warmer and colder regions. Now, as the Rusby waves become chaotic, agricultural production becomes chaotic. And there's a very interesting paper, it's been published in December 2019 in Nature, which posits that it's not inconceivable that this year, next year, or the following year, there could be a simultaneous obliteration of, of, of agricultural production in different regions of the world, meaning sudden starvation in, at a large scale. Now, it's as sudden as this COVID, unexpected, but long predicted. And here's the challenge to us all, how do we here, us here, transform our decision-making process in a connected way that we simultaneously seize control over the emissions as we seize control of the ability of controlling the concentrations in the atmosphere through regenerating the very precious forest that we now enjoy on our walks around Zurich, but in a very real way as, uh, as a CO2 absorbing mechanism. At a very low level, COVID is much too high. 50%, 80% tree, below COVID level of economic activity to meet the Wackernagelschen objective of, of staying below a, a one earth footprint fall. This is the, the very challenge right here and now. And here it is back to you, Thomas. Okay. <clears throat> Who wants to answer this very <laughs> radical question? What's the momentum to create? Who wants to answer? Thomas, Stefano, Maria. Uh, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, Matis. Yes, Matis, you're back from the right. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, just to, 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 I wrote a little bit in, in, the, in the chat as well, but I think just to look at the big opportunity. So no question, I think, and that's a, that's a conservative estimate. We may be by factor three, if not more. Meta, meta, our material metabolism may be by a factor three or more above what I think Earth can renew you know, overall. So there's a, a huge gap. It's a huge gap, and that cannot be addressed overnight that easily. And we don't even recognize that as the overarching challenge yet in the global discourse. It's not the kind of the number one concern. And it's kind of the level of the metabolic difference between where we would need to be to be on a sustainable path and where we are right now. But I would like to talk about quickly about what are the big opportunities. One, one thing to mention, it may be a, a difficult topic, but I think it's a very life embracing and positive and, and compassionate topic, is that as we have smaller families, so if, if, if today in, around the world we had natalities similar to Spain, Italy, Portugal, Japan, or Germany, we would be at four to five billion people by the end of the century. And there are people born already today who will live then, you know, or if the median projection happens, we'll be at 11.6 billion people by the end of the century. That's a big difference of kind of <laughs> where we would be and, and what we want to leave as a legacy for the next generation. It's not about being against people, it's about compassionately saying, wow, we can actually choose the size of our, our families and, 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 and choose health and choose the possibilities of women, et cetera, to get there. So I just want to say from a, just a big perspective, there are big areas where we can do much, much better. What we can see, opportunities we can seize right now, for example, is, which we have seen, for example, in Oakland, where I live, as there are many fewer cars driving, Oakland then closed 10% of its roads so people can walk more easily. We, I think we should close half of the roads, at least, or more everywhere, because they're not needed. And we can give the space so that people can walk in the city, not so close to each other, and retake that space and recognize, like the, even the, 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 the Dutch recognized the, the, the cost to society of a kilometer of bicycling is 10 times lower than the cost of public transportation, for example, and it's healthier. Like, so so there, there, there are ways that we can transform the city right now. Another thing that we can see is right now, yes, we are captured by our own homes, but there are also positive sides. I think people are able to think a little bit more on their own, be more reflective. The creativity that's coming out that you can see on the internet and social media is quite astonishing that in the, through this time. So, so I, I think thinking, on your own also helps to overcome some of the polarization that we have experienced, particularly through kind of the popularism. And we can see that the populist answers don't work so well anymore and that actually COVID is not a wedge issue. We really want to find yeah, out together what helps us best. So there are all these opportunities where together uh, we, we, can, we can choose the, mo the, 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 the moment because what's striking is that which we couldn't have predicted three months ago, humanity has chosen life over economy. 
And that's a big switch, a big mental switch. So I think civil engagement still happens. We don't see it in the spaces as much, but people engage through social media. We're talking with our neighbors. So I think this, if, we, if we bring the right narrative in about how all the opportunities that we are now seeing come emerging and strengthening those, we can build the track onto a path that actually becomes consistent physically with the size of our planet. It's a big transformation. It's totally possible. And I think there are a lot of positive strengths we can seize on right now. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Mat Matisse. Anybody else? Jump yeah. in. If I can. Sure. Uh, let me be a little bit provocative and share with you my, my, my little frustrations. Um, you know, it took us in WHO 50 years to do something about tobacco. 50 from the day we have uh, scientific evidence that the tobacco was causing lung cancer until the day we have a, a tobacco treaty convention. And still the people has been reacting very uh, resistant to that. They didn't want it to stop smoke. Right, and uh, who cares? I need to die, so it's my choice and whatever. I've been saying that air pollution is killing 7 million deaths every year, linking that to the climate change. You have been putting all the arguments about what climate change is doing to all of us, to humanity, to our health, to our agriculture, to the planet, name it. And here we are. We have a virus and humanity decided to go on something without present. You said, Matthias, that it, it was because people decided to go over life instead of economy. No, I don't think it was life, the motivation. The motivation was fear to death, which is very different, different completely different. It's not because I say, oh, I want a healthy life, I, I want a healthy old people, that therefore I will make a sacrifice. No, it's because we were terrified about death and disease. And this is a completely different argument. So that's why I say I'm a little bit provocative. We need to learn from this and say, okay, what motivates people? What has motivated people here is panic, definitely, and um, you know this fear and this irrational approach as well to a virus that is perceived as something immediate, something that you cannot control. So we need to now align our narrative around that. We cannot come back saying, okay, climate change will cause much more damage than uh, the, the virus, which is probably even true, but we, we have to say, we will work on reduce your vulnerability to having again an event like this one. I'm sorry, but we need to be very opportunistic on this one. Otherwise, um, the, the mentality of the people will not be prepared to absorb yet, yet another call for, 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 for drama or for, for, for disaster, which is happening. But we need to now handle our human beings in a more uh, protective way. Um, those are the, 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 the other day a journalist was asking me uh, why WHO didn't uh, force countries to go on a lockdown from the first case. How many deaths WHO has as a criteria to decrease a lockdown? And I say, wait a minute, we never ever in the history of public health WHO or anyone has proposed a lockdown doesn't exist. I mean, it, even in the name of pro cancer prevention or, or, or meningitis for, for children, we, we never even ask anyone to close all the schools. That will be unacceptable. And this time, they are now, even the journalists say, okay, one death will be enough for WHO to declare a lockdown. So things have changed a lot. And I hope we are leaving this crisis with uh, an economic uh, crisis, Everyone distanciate from each other, wearing masks, wearing gloves, prepared to be suspicious of one to each other, not sharing the public space or the space for the public, and uh, terrified, but still accepting everything. So how can we use that change of mentality on the good way, on the opportunistic way, and the positive recovery and, and then changing mentalities here? But we need to be very quick, very strategic, and a little bit opportunistic politically. And we need anthropologists and psychologists to, view, uh, to help us, because this will be about how to 
oriented that mentality that now becomes suddenly people doesn't care about uh, about uh, freedom about democracy you are telling people you will have an app that will uh, tell everyone where are you every moment and they say yes please when can i have it this never happened in the history of humanity but here we are so if a little virus could do that we we, who are supposed to be much more intelligent than the virus, I hope, we should be able to then transform it into something different and a revolution that uh, we will never have another opportunity like, like this one again. And, I yet you, and yet you said, Diane, that it was the fear of death that caused that quick response. But you're also saying in the same breath, we should not use that threat to get people to act. Well, I think this is a, a contradiction. As long as we're not able to face the threat face on. And, and I note that, for instance, uh, Greta Thunberg, who uh, you know, made us face the threat, is completely obliterated by the virus, uh, the collective threat. Uh, it's not even a voice anymore. So it, I think we, we need to really, I mean, uh, Thomas has been in this business for a long time, and, 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 and Matthias too. Uh, how do you confront people with their own uh, mortality uh, stay positive by all means, but don't be so positive people go back to sleep. And uh, I think Tom has been waiting for a response here, or giving you a response, is that right? I'll try and be really quick, which is difficult with such a big question. But um, look, I think two things. One, switching to a world that operates within the planetary boundaries that Matisse has explained is not going to be a walk in the park. It is going to be a huge transition. Uh, a few years ago, McKinsey made the comparison. Uh, they looked at the change during the Industrial Revolution and the change needed now for decarbonization. Um, and it's on a similar scale in that back in the 19th century, the, um, the efficiency of labor um, was increased 10 times. Now we need to increase 10 times at least the uh, efficiency of the way we use carbon. Um, so it's a comparable to the Industrial Revolution, but it needs to happen about three to four times faster. So just if you want the scale of what we're going through at the moment, it's the Industrial Revolution on steroids happening three to four times faster. And look at Take a list of the largest companies in any sector in, in the year 1800 and the year 1900, and you will have hardly any companies from the list from 1800 that are still on the list from 1900. Um, so you have completely obliterated most of the incumbents before that process. That is also what's going to happen now. Um, I, I hate to say that, but most of the companies in existence today will not make that shift because they will be too slow. Um, so we need to then go and look for where are the innovators, where are the disruptors, and where is that going to come from? Now, so that's point one. It's going to be really disruptive. Point two, if you look at how um, technological adoption has happened historically, it's never happened in a linear fashion. It's always happened in S-curves. Uh, any, almost any technology you take has, has been adopted in S-curves. Uh, and that's actually fascinating when you look at things like the growth of renewable energies. Take, for example, the predict predictions from the International Energy Agency. So these are the worldwide experts when it comes to energy. And compare that to what has happened in the last 10 years in terms of the switch from fossil to renewable. And it's absolutely amazing. What the International Energy Agency did is they did a linear projection of the growth of solar and wind. And of course, what has happened is it's been exponential growth because that's what happens in these technological adoptions. So while it is going to be really hard to make this transition, I don't think it's impossible because, again, if I look to how these technologies uh, actually get adopted, th that's the kind of disruption which we are seeing in energy today, we are seeing in transport today, we are starting to see in agriculture today. When people ask me, are we going to make it? I have to say, I don't have a clue if we're going to make it, but I know that we have the disruptive power to make these kind of shifts. And frankly, whether the 
pr probability of us making the shift to net zero by 2050 uh, or is 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 two percent or eighty percent doesn't make a difference. I'm going to give it everything I have for us to make that transition. Thanks so much. Yeah, let's let's suppose then that architects and planners can be a disruptive element in this story or part of it or or participate in this disruption, which should probably be systematic. There's lots of questions, and we probably won't be able to have all of them. Maybe uh, uh, Michel Tranda Pition about the size of the cities and the densities. Yes. What's Go that? ahead. You asked the questions about the, the question between mobility and size of cities and modes yes. of life. Yes, just because I, I've read and I've heard uh, a few persons like uh, Dominique Bou and others saying that we should go towards small cities or 100,000 or 300,000. I wanted to hear from you, um, several of you, uh, what do you think about it? Is it um, just a, a, a theor theoretical idea or, or are we, should we really go in this direction and why? I have ideas, but I'm very interested in hearing you. Thank you. Anybody? <clears throat> Jumping in on this size question, and the question is how to react against global cities that are already there, and how can we deal with this global urbaniz urbanization, which makes mega, huge, humongous cities happen? Yes, may I intervene about architecture, please? Yes, go ahead. Let me present myself, Bogdan Fezi. I'm an architect. I'm a, I'm a professor. And uh, I also uh, am interested in um, uh, about this uh, crisis and impact of, uh, in architecture. Uh, let me first say I'm a little bit puzzled because uh, it happened again. Uh, if we only think about uh, uh, leper, uh, about, um, about uh, uh, tuberculosis and uh, about plague, and the, the solutions we adopted at the time were the same, was isolation, was uh, quarantine, the Italian term, and confinement. They were the same solution. And in the 19th century, the biggest uh, new plague, tuberculosis, was attacked with architectural and urban solutions. And we should probably add that uh, uh, the urbanism, as we know it, is uh, most of it a reaction to uh, tuberculosis crisis, which uh, still were the third cause of mortality in Europe and, uh, and the United States in the 1900s. And uh, the first uh, uh, hygienist movement in, in Paris was uh, an architectural and urban reaction. And most of the architecture as we know it uh, now about ventilation, distances in between uh, buildings, is uh, it's a part of this uh, reaction against tuberculosis. The only treatment at the time was, uh, was the sun. And uh, till 1943, the discovery of the streptomycin uh, architecture gave the sanatoriums and then the uh, modernist movement in architecture and we may say that later on, we assisted uh, uh, to a, a separation between medicine and architecture because medicine could uh, emancipate uh, from, uh, from the need of architecture. Uh, what I found very interesting because in the late uh, few months, we have uh, scientific studies which are conducted in South Korea, which are conducted in, in, uh, in um, in, in China, first, they made the same link as uh, tuberculosis did between the uh, population density and the mortality. In 1904, the first international Congress uh, about uh, hygiene was held in Paris. Uh, uh, a 7,700 pages report uh, made a, a direct link in between the population density and, uh, and, um, and the mortality. Uh, now, uh, several comparisons are made in between maps of Europe, United States, and Italy, 
which indicate the same thing. So uh, we have the, this uh, comparison in between uh, the maps showing the mortality and the density. They are uh, precisely the, the, the perfect one. But the scientific studies conducted in, uh, in uh, South Korea and China are, uh, are very interesting uh, because uh, they made study about how, um, how uh, droplets spread in, uh, in ventilation, about how droplets spread in uh, office spaces, in op often office spaces, how they spread in, uh, in, uh, in uh, small confined spaces. And uh, my point about it is that uh, we have to, to treat, uh, we have to prevent, not to treat. So the first thing about prevention are a lot of ecological uh, aspects. Then before treating, we have, to, uh, we have to use containment measures. Those containment measures are more architectural than urban. I hear a lot about urbanism, but let me tell you, there are uh, three ways of, uh, of uh, spreading the disease. One is the droplets, which is two meters distance. This is not the urban scale. The other one is direct contact. This is not the urban scale. And the other one is aerosols. And aerosols, they can spread in buildings. They are very, very, uh, very, very dangerous. And uh, my, my point of view is that uh, uh, we have to, uh, to make a difference in between the uh, population density, which is very important from the ecological point of view, from the building density, which is different, and from spaces where this, uh, this contact uh, occurs. This is a, a totally different study. It's a mix of architecture and uh, uh, epidemiology. I think it should be done. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, a topics I wanted to, to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdan. One more question, and maybe two, and then we, we should slowly end up with a final statement. Anybody who wants to jump in? Very interesting remark by Bogdan about the different scales of, uh, of approach that should be combined and be over, overlapping to some extent, which means that there should probably be a new way of teaching things in architecture schools and planning schools in the way that we could be understand these elements that have been somehow forgotten in the last few uh, decades. I yeah. can simply, uh, yeah, yeah, just a just few words. I think it's, uh, uh, well, in the 60s, uh, I probably, probably you remember uh, that was this uh, really very successful discipline was called prosemic. Uh, Edward Hall. Edward Hall was writing two, two, main, two very important books on, on, on prosemics and he was trying really to, to distinguish between uh, intimate distance, uh, personal, private distance, social distance and public distance. And uh, he was seriously working and prosemic is putting together semiotics, psychology, design, ethology, anthropology, and for sure, sociology and urban sociology. And was was an amazing, an amazing, let's say, uh, uh, hub uh, of, uh, of a different bunch of, of disciplines. And well, I think we have to go back in a way to prosemic. It uh, will be extremely helpful. We have totally forgotten to to, to, to back to what was saying prosemic and uh, and uh, and um, but uh, the other issue is that it's so complicated now to find a place where we can combine all these uh, different perspectives on the same uh, focus like public space but we have to do that and for that reason I'm going back to Roland Barthes because Roland Barthes in his uh, sixth cycle of, of seminars, Collège de France, 1977, was talking about distance, the idea of distance between our prosemics. And uh, I think it's a uh, job. Yeah, no, no, no solution, simply a suggestion. Okay, we're moving to the final uh, phase. I would like to ask you, everybody, each one of you, even and also the, our two uh, respondents, to state one to take uh, seriously uh, Matisse's proposal, the I question, what do I want 
where should I, where am I standing in this uh, overall change I want to happen now? Let's put it. Let's double this question and say that if each one of you wanted to have a one personal um, choice to make and one and one collective choice to make, what would this be? You know, let's let's go ahead and be bold enough in your way you think. Uh, for example, I would like to stop totally the touristic uh, pub uh, publicity in uh, newspapers and television. No, like 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 uh, smoking. Nobody would be should be any more uh, advised to take a trip, a touristic trip. For example, this is my attitude. But there, what ha there has been. Yeah. I start. There has been no better moment to get to car-free cities than now. I want that. Um, what I, I would like is to see us move from using GDP as a key performance indicator of, of, of the world to moving to using well-being, which balances environment, health, jobs, shelter, education, social well-being. Um, so we, we have a more balanced concept of what to evaluate the performance of a global economy. I fully endorse that. I think it's brilliant. Don't use uh, GDP anymore as an indicator of uh, success. And uh, my second one will be, I will put a, a tag on the fossil fuels. I mean, on the petrol station, when you go to with your car, I will put a, a, a tag saying fossil fuels kills similar to the ones we do for the tobacco. And it's not a dream. I will do it if I can. <laughs> uh, I mine should... would simply be, let's stop using our tax receipts to subsidize fossil fuel companies, please. Yeah, that's right. Uh, civil tax disobedience. Um, a good suggestion. We also, I mean, if I had my wish, I would spend 100% of the COVID bailout money on renewables and regeneration of agriculture and doing all the stuff that I was arguing for and zero of it on what it's being spent now on the hardwiring of the status quo. This is a once in a hundred years opportunity to spend this huge amount of money in a way that creates jobs but ensures um, the stability of our climate. Fantastic remarks. Thanks so much. We've been um, filming all that. We'll put it together. So uh, we thank you so much for being so long. We stayed more than two hours together, making yourselves available to, for such an enterprise, this collective discussion from all over the world. As we said in the Gibraltar Foundation, we're really striving to put, push things forward in that sense. We're organizing, therefore, a transition workshop this summer. You go ahead on our website to look for it. And we're already happy to answer your questions. Thanks for everybody to the earth and we'll, we'll change the world. Thank you.